Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Kelly Pirtle with NOAA Communications in Norman, Oklahoma, and I'm also a member of NOAA's Central Region Collaboration Team. I'm your host for today's webinar. Today's three-minute thesis webinar is focused on water. The NOAA Central Re and West Regional Collaboration Teams have worked together to bring you this webinar designed to share experiences and information about NOAA's role related to hydrology. From studies of the past, current operations and initiatives, to innovative research, you will have the chance to hear straight from the experts on a wide variety of water-related topics. I am so excited to hear these presentations and hope you will enjoy them as well. Each of today's panelists will have three minutes and one slide to cover their topic. This format is based on a model used by universities across the country as a way to briefly share information about a project, initiative, or research. You can see from the outline on your screen, after each group, we will take a break for questions from you, our audience. And near the end of the hour, all of the panelists will return to respond to your questions for a few minutes. At any point during the presentations, please submit your questions in writing using the questions pane of the GoToWebinar panel. Asia Shumalo, the coordinator for the NOAA West Regional Collaboration Team, will be taking your questions and sharing them with our presenters. We are recording today's webinar and it will be posted by Wednesday on our homepage, www.noaa.gov slash central region. We'd love to get your feedback on today's event. Please take a moment at the conclusion of the webinar to complete a very brief survey. So let's get started. I can't think of a better way to begin our webinar than with a presentation describing a day in the life of a river forecast center. Ryan Fleeman is a senior hydrologist and incident meteorologist at the NOAA National Weather Service Ohio River Forecast Center. He grew up on a small river in the Ohio Valley and enjoys providing critical river forecasts for the same region today. Coordination and collaboration is becoming even more important in the National Weather Service's mission, and the River Forecast Centers are working hard to provide core partners with much needed information. During the Western wildfire season, he it, no, routinely gets dispatched to provide micro-scale meteorology forecasts for incident management teams managing large wildfires. Doing both fire and water seems a bit strange, but it keeps him well-versed in all aspects of the National Weather Service. Ryan, tell us more about the River Forecast Centers. All right, well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the group today. Uh, just to touch a little bit about kind of just the day in the life of River Forecast Centers. A lot of times we don't get a lot of that public face that the uh, weather forecast offices may get. Uh, so this is just a little bit on Kind of what we do and how we go about it uh, both in the kind of slower times and also in the busier times. Uh, so as many are aware there are 13 uh, National Weather Service river forecast centers across the country. Uh, we all understand the different climate regimes that each one or that is present across the United States. So while there might be some issues in the northeast they're completely different than what's uh, present out in the Colorado basin or even in the northwest. Uh, so RFCs are tasked with many aspects of the hydrological analysis, including snow estimations as well as past rainfall. And then we also take into account future rainfall estimations, put all that together, and then uh, come up with the official river forecast center for various spots across the country. Uh, as noted, each RFC has its own unique sets of challenges. In the east, a lot of times we're dealing with floods and routing that water through the system in a non-hazardous manner, whereas in the West, a lot of times, they're trying to conserve that water that they get in the winter in hopes of utilizing it throughout their drier seasons, which a lot of times is in the summer and into the fall. Uh, RFCs deal with hydrology issues both in the uh, preparation phase. A lot of times that would incorporate stuff with FEMA, whether we do tabletop exercises with them or coordination with U.S. Army Corps on uh, proper management and how to um, most efficiently utilize the flood storage projects that they have. Uh, we take that right through the event itself, and then we uh, take it right through the recovery efforts. A lot of times we get tagged by the U.S. Coast Guard to provide uh, river stages, velocity forecast, if there were be, 
to be some form of an incident that occurred during the event. It would be in those salvage or recovery times. Uh, timely and accurate forecasts are the backbone of RFC operations. Here we can see one of our critical points at the Ohio River Forecast Center uh, would be at Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, this is our main task, especially during these flood operations, is making sure we give them the most accurate forecast uh, that we can based on the knowledge that we have. Uh, moving forward, our coordination with our, our partners at all levels is crucial to provide one consistent message. As we move through the decision support services that is becoming ever more important with the weather service, providing that one single consistent message between the weather service, FEMA, the Corps, the USGS, as well as the Coast Guard is one of the uh, key missions of the River Forecast Centers because without each partner, uh, incident response could falter and therefore there could be many messages out there which could lead to confusion, uh, not only with the public, but also with our partners as well. And if you get those mixed messages, a lot of times it could lead to uh, improper incident response. Uh, so with that, I think that pretty well sums up just kind of just touching upon uh, just a little bit of the daily life of River Forecast Centers. Obviously, this is about a two and a half minute snippet and it takes years to pick up on all of it. Uh, but I feel this is just touching on the high points as well as I possibly could. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity and um, I think that pretty well wraps it up. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for that overview. Now you'll hear from Peggy Lee with the National Weather Service's National Water Center located in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. She's a techniques and development hydrologist with the center's operations division, which provides water prediction and impact-based decision support services. Peggy was the third person to arrive at the National Water Center's operations division when it started only three and a half years ago. Since then, they have grown to be a team of 22 and now plan to hire 19 additional people by this fall. She will talk about how the National Water Center offers and plans to offer water prediction operations for the nation as they march toward their full operating capability this summer. Peggy, tell us more. Thank you, thank you for having me. So what did we do to make something from scratch to offer water prediction operations for the entire nation? That's something never done from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So well, aside from us writing many, many documents and having meetings and practicing various phases of operations, either routine or enhanced, using the National Water Model Analysis and Forecast, our GIS specialists have developed many map services for water resources and analysis and prediction for 3.4 million river miles to be exact. And then you can see that example in the top left map highlighting the potential of high water 10 days from the reference time. And these map services help forecasters tease out important information from one terabyte of the national water model data set thrown at us every single day. And our software engineers developed many amazing tools so our forecasters can maintain good situational awareness of the entire nation and provide impact-based decision support services including briefing, and to our core partners and stakeholders. Also, our forecasters have developed some prototypes that hopefully soon in the future will become the official National Weather Service products after diligent testing and reviewing processes. As an example, we currently issue the National Hydrologic Discussion once a day, and that's a text discussion of observed, modeled, and then expected hydrologic conditions for the United States for the next 10 days. We also issue the National Flood Hazard Outlook shown at the top middle graphic. It's a high-level heads-up infographic highlighting potential flood impacts for the next seven days. And then the area hydrologic discussion shown in the bottom middle graphic is an episodic pro prototype highlighting an area with the potential of rapid onset flooding impacts with the lead time of two to six hours. All those three will become experimental in June 2022 and become available to the public. Also, we are in the process of developing the National Weather Service wide flood inundation maps operations, but our forecasters can provide real time evaluation of various flood inundation maps, including those that the National Water Center offers. So we can offer a reach back support to the National Weather Service field offices and core partners. And our winter hydrology and remote sensing desk issues snow water equivalent analysis and forecast, just like the one on the bottom right graphic, 
and offers river ice surveillance during the winter season. And those are essential in forecasting spring flooding. And they offer briefings and coordinate with the National Weather Service field offices on airborne snow survey operations. So that's a very, very quick overview of what the National Water Center's Operations Division offers as we march towards and go beyond the full operating capability. So stay tuned, lots of new exciting things are coming from us and feel free to email me if you'd like to discuss further. Uh, thanks again uh, for having me and back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Peggy. We look forward to watching all that you um, are developing there. Our next presenter is Dr. Jonathan Gorley, a research hydrologist with the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. And he's also an affiliate associate professor with the School of Meteorology and the Civil Engineering Department at the University of Oklahoma. His primary research interests are in unique observations of storm scale hydrometeorological states and fluxes and development of models to forecast them. He has published more than 150 peer-reviewed articles and a textbook titled Radar Hydrology. JJ will discuss research he has led at the Severe Storms Lab to improve the accuracy, timing, and specificity of flash flood warnings. Tell us more about flash, JJ. Thank you for the introduction, Kelly. Um, so flash stands for the Flooded Locations and Simulated Hydrographs Project. And it is a component of the, of the larger MRMS, which stands for multi-radar, multi-sensor. And so this is a suite of algorithms that encompass severe weather hazards ranging from tornadoes to hail to wind, heavy rainfall, and then flash flooding. So uh, it is a component of that. The one thing that these algorithms have in common is they're primarily driven by NEXRAD. Uh, they operate on the same one kilometer square uh, grid across the entire US and outer territories. And some of the products are updated every two minutes. Um, the flash products that we have are grouped into three different categories that I list on the left. Uh, one of them is comparing the real-time estimates of rainfall to flash flood guidance ratios. So these are uh, rainfall thresholds that are developed at, at the river forecast centers and then disseminated to the weather forecast offices. Uh, next is we compare the uh, real-time precipitation estimates to a gauge-based rainfall climatology. Um, and with that, you're able to compute what's called an average recurrence interval, also known as a return period of rainfall. Um, and then thirdly, we compare or we take the rainfall estimates and we input them into rainfall runoff models. So three, uh, in fact, are, are used in real time. And these models are updated and produce outputs every 10 minutes across the United States. Um, one of the products that forecasters have come to use is uh, unit stream flow. So this is a forecast of the discharge that's normalized by the upstream area. And with that, forecasters have developed a lot of experience on how to uh, recognize the spatial extent of pluvial flooding. Um, and you can see some examples there on the right during Hurricane Harvey and then also Tropical Storm Imelda. Also the timing. Uh, so when are, when are things ramping up and when can uh, forecasters start to allow some of the flash flood warnings to expire um, and then also the severity of the impact so uh, again forecasters have developed some of their own local thresholds and and we can see like when values exceed 10 that's shown here on the uh, Harvey case that's typically indicative of a catastrophic flash flooding event and so because of this we have delivered this to the forecast uh, to the uh, INSEP uh, about five years ago and uh, since then forecasters um, have begun using this as really their primary uh, choice for guidance for flash flood warning in, in their uh, operations. <clears throat> More recently, we've been uh, advancing the models so that they uh, become aware that there have been uh, land surface impacts due to things like wildfire. And so we are developing um, additional products to indicate um, the possibility of debris flows and flash flooding on, uh, on burn scars. Um, and so it's uh, just in general, the, the products are always being advanced and, uh, and we are developing more impact-based products that'll indicate uh, the possibility of there being a base considerable or even catastrophic level of flash floods. So with that, I'll go ahead and end and uh, thank you. Thank you, JJ. Uh, we will now take a few minutes to address some questions. So JJ is gonna stay on and uh, Ryan and Peggy are going to come on, and Asia is there too. 
Asia, do you have some questions for us? Yes, I do. Uh, my first question is for Ryan. Uh, how do the 13 river forecast centers provide a seamless message across their borders? So we work closely with all of our neighbors. Uh, obviously, we have about four RCs that that uh, border us, a little different than weather forecast offices, but we're in close coordination with them. And even in our case, uh, we send our flows down to the Lower Mississippi River Forecast Center out of the Ohio River. So we've got to have close coordination and collaboration with the next office downstream just to make sure it's that seamless transition from our office to the next River Forecast Center. Great, thank you, Ryan. Um, my next question is for Peggy. Uh, Peggy, where can we find the prototypes that you mentioned in your presentation? Excellent. So for the internal folks, uh, those prototypes that are under experimental phase sort of right now, um, under review, that's available on our intranet page. And then I provided the link within the slide. So hopefully um, folks can get the slide later in the future and then click on the link. Awesome, thank you, Peggy. Uh, the next question is for JJ. What are the biggest challenges in forecasting flash floods? Uh, the biggest challenge I would say would be uh, the lack of uh, high quality radar data consistent across the US and the outer territories, in particular, Alaska. Um, so those are some areas where we need to rely on some other sensors at present. And, and uh, hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll find some other gap filling radar solutions, either on the ground or in space or, or wherever. Uh, so that's one of the big, bigger challenges. Also, the observational uh, database of flash floods is, is uh, challenging. Uh, at present, we rely heavily on storm data reports that come from National Weather Service forecasters. And these are primarily used to validate a warning that was issued and it wasn't necessarily meant to be an independent database and we use it as such. So we're looking forward to some remote sensing um, uh, possibilities in the future coming from space that could you know, uh, delineate the spatial extent, even the depth of flooding or some of the information that we could use. Great, thank you, JJ. Uh, I have another question for the, from the audience for Peggy. Um, so the question is, I guess flooding forecast highly depends on the weather forecast. I'm curious, how do you handle and identify the uncertainty from weather forecasts when you do flooding forecasts? So that's the question that probably applies to Ryan, who works at the Ohio RFC as well. But we have a kind of two flavors of the model. Um, one is forced by GFS forecast um, weather model, and then the other one is forced by HAR model. So we can look at two model flavors um, forced by two different meteorological forcings. So that way we can um, compare and then decide which um, output might be more applicable um, depending on the confidence we have with the meteorological model. Um, also in the future, uh, as the national water model continues to improve, we're going to get to see more outputs from various different meteorological forcings. So that would be another um, strength that we can have to see um, different potential hydrologic forecasts with varying forcings. Thank you for that, Peggy. Ryan, do you have anything to add to that answer or? No, I think Peggy summed it up really good. Um, they're they're kind of uh, confined by the national water model. We we have the luxury. We a lot of our people are cross trained. We have a lot of meteorologists as, at our office, and we're also co located with the Wilmington, Ohio weather forecast office. So there's an abundance of knowledge in the building that we're able to leverage. Uh, leverage so definitely helps out in our cause. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I have one more question for Ryan or. Um, I'll go to one for Ryan. Um, and so there's a question about how NOAA river forecasts interconnect with Corps of Engineers and USGS forecasts. Sure. Uh, that's one of our biggest things that we've moved to is coordination and collaboration with our partners. Uh, we, we work closely with the district and the division offices of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and also our uh, regional water science centers for the USGS. So. Uh, when we are in high flow events, we're constantly coordinating with those partners, making sure our inputs are known, their inputs are known, so we can get that most accurate forecast out to the public. Great. Um, thank you guys all for the great answers, and thanks to the audience for the excellent questions. And with that, I'll turn it back to Kelly. Thank you, Asia. Thank you, um, panelists. 
Uh, good questions, good discussion. Uh, remember, you can type your question in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, I also put in the chat box a link um, that is relevant for the National Water Center prototypes. Um, so our next speaker is Scott Young, a senior hydrologist at the Ohio River Forecast Center. Scott started his career working for the Forest Service in the streams of Wyoming and Idaho. Sounds lovely. Uh, he then transferred to the Natural Resource Conservation Service before joining the National Weather Service in Wilmington, Ohio. Scott has been involved with calibration and configuration of the hydrologic models used at his River Forecast Center and is now part of the team implementing HEFS, the Hydrologic Ensemble Forecast Service. Uh, Scott, tell us more about that. Okay, thanks Kelly. Thanks, good afternoon everyone. Um, that last question was great. That leads right into my thing is that it's the uncertainty of the, of the, of the for, forecasted rainfall is what the problem is with our stuff. So that leads right into the probabilistic forecasting. So probabilistic, probabilistic forecasting is really about uncertainty. How do we quantify the uncertainty in our forecasts and then convey that information to our end users in a simple to understand way? Our current official river forecast is based on a single set of deterministic inputs, mainly precipitation and temperature. We then run those inputs through our hydrologic models to produce a single deterministic stage hydrograph. Our current forecasts contain no information about uncertainty or risk. And as the former director of the Weather Service, Louis Uccellini would say, the only thing we know about that forecast is that it's going to be wrong. The river forecast centers use forecasts of precipitation in the river forecast, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. It turns out that this is the biggest source of error in the river forecast. In our deterministic forecast, we only get one forecast or scenario as to what we think the future rainfall might look like. But if we look at the weather models, they produce multiple scenarios as to what the future precipitation might be. They try to capture the uncertainty by producing multiple scenarios or ensembles of future precipitation and temperature. So the simplest approach to probabilistic forecasting was to take the forecast of precipitation and temperature from the weather models and run them through the hydrologic models. This then creates ensembles of possible stage hydrographs. We can then create a distribution from these hydrographs sample that distribution to get the median and other exceedance probabilities. We then plot these on a hydrograph and the end user can see the most likely scenario, the median, or the, probabil the probability of exceeding different flood levels. They can also see the confidence in the forecast by looking at the spread of ensemble members. This process became known as MMEFS, or the Meteorological Model Ensemble Forecast System. This has two parts, the NAVES and the GEFs, and you can see more information about that on the slide. The MMEFS is good at capturing the confidence in the forecast, but it doesn't really do much to capture modeling errors. The Office of, the Hydro of Hydrology, now the Office of Water Prediction, is working on a new probabilistic forecasting system called HEFS, a Hydrologic Ensemble Forecast Service. Their approach was to use the weather models as inputs, but to bias correct them before putting them through the hydrologic models. They created a preprocessor that uses an error distribution to remove the bias in the weather models. The processor then uses historical simulations to distrib distribute that error through time. The bias corrected ensembles are then run through the hydrologic models to create multiple hydrographs. We can then sample those hydrographs just like an MMEFS. This attempts to remove the modeling error in the inputs to the hydrologic models. This process can also be applied to the output of the hydrologic models. HEFS has a post-processor that attempts to remove the errors in our hydrologic models the same way it removes the biases from the weather models, but that is still in an experimental status. If you'd like to see any of these products, you can visit the webpage listed at the bottom of the slide. And thank you, and I'll take any questions at the, after the break. Thank you, Scott, for explaining a complicated topic in an understandable way. Next, we'll jump up to the Northeast to hear from Britt Westergaard. She has been a hydrologist with the federal government for more than two decades and is currently the senior service hydrologist at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Albany, New York. Britt has been fascinated with humans' attempts to tame nature since reading The Control of Nature as a young, impressionable geology undergrad, and now works to educate emergency management and the public on flood preparedness. Understanding and conveying to our partners 
what aspects of ice jams can be mitigated and what should simply be avoided is part of the fun of winter hydrology. Britt? Thank you, Kelly. And thank you to the Three Minute Thesis team for the invitation to speak. As part of the National Weather Service's mission to provide forecasts and warnings for the protection of life and property, uh, weather forecast offices like mine are obligated to warn the public of flood threats. This includes floods caused by interactions between human infrastructure and nature. One of the most complicated of these flood threats in the Northeast is ice jams. Ice jams are highly localized, but can cause significant damage to buildings, roads, and anything else that gets in their way. Many winters, we see roads closed for weeks and sometimes months until the ice jams break up. You can follow along with the typical ice jam life cycle on the looping video you see. During the coldest parts of the winter, ice builds on rivers, getting thicker and stronger the longer and colder the cold periods are. Then something has to happen to break that ice apart a river rise high enough to lift the ice and smash it. Usually this is from a significant rainfall event with a snow melting warm up. Once the river ice is a giant flotilla of icebergs, it floats downstream on the swollen river. Eventually the flotilla may hit a spot that it can't quite squeeze through and stops. It's not always the same spot and doesn't happen with every ice breakup, but likely candidates include sharp bends in the river or channel obstructions like bridge pylons. Once the flotilla has stopped, water can back up behind this temporary dam and spill out onto the floodplain. When the jam finally breaks, hours, days, or even months later, the water behind the dam is released, sometimes catastrophically releasing a wall of water containing large chunks of ice. So how do we provide warnings to the public given the number of times I've just used my hedge words like may, can, and sometimes? We have two main modes of alerting for ice jam flood threats. First, we can be proactive. We use our seven day forecast temperatures and precipitation along with some empirical rules of thumb, as well as forecasts of river rises provided by our river forecast centers to determine windows of time and general geographic areas that are most at risk for river ice breakup. An example of what the messaging in the seven day window looks like is inset on my slide. This is a one page briefing we provided to our emergency management partners on a Tuesday for ice jam potential on Thursday and Friday. Secondly, we find ourselves in a reactive posture when the ice breakup and movement is ongoing. The good news is that we've trained a number of river ice spotters who routinely report on conditions at locations where ice jams often form. The bad news is that because snowmelt is often driven by daytime warning, warming, the peak stream flow and thus ice jam threat is often in the middle of the night. The warnings and advisories for these immediate threats are specific to actual locations where ice jam flooding is being reported. So you can imagine that the operational pace for tracking this can be a challenge. This is all, of course, a very high level overview of the many unique challenges presented by ice jams. I welcome your comments and questions in the question period and via follow up email. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. Such an interesting video. Our third speaker in this group is Dustin Goring. He's a senior hydrologist at the National Weather Service North Central River Forecast Center in Chanhassen, Minnesota, where he started working in June 2008 during the record-setting Iowa floods. What a time to start. Prior to working at the River Forecast Center, he was a hydrologic technician for the USDA Ag Agricultural Research Service. Dustin's talk today will highlight how field observations and modeling have been used to produce a unique decision support tool across the Great Lakes region. Dustin? Thanks, Kelly, and good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to present on runoff risk decision support tools, which are one way the National Weather Service is helping to reduce the occurrence of harmful algal blooms, as well as the hypoxic zone down in the Gulf of Mexico. Essentially, these tools are a first of their kind effort that enables farmers and producers in those states to be more effective with their nutrient application planning via a real-time forecast risk index. Some background is useful to understand the desire for these types of tools. The big picture is that many states are facing increasing rates and coverage of water quality degradation, requiring them to develop comprehensive nutrient reduction strategies. Stemming from this work, a deficiency and attention placed on application timing was noted. And this was reinforced with studies relying on nearly 20 years of on-farm edge of field research that identified the impact and importance of application timing decisions on nutrient transport. 
a key research finding noted that the largest runoff events contribute the majority of the nutrients lost. Therefore, one poor application timing decision could totally negate an entire year's worth of conservation efforts. For this reason, runoff risk was fine-tuned to correlate with the largest runoff events that carry the highest impact. Encouraging usage of these tools into short-term farm management planning could result in more effective application timing and less nutrients lost over time. Support from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, or GLRI, has enabled runoff risk tools in four states currently, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio, with New York in uh, beta testing mode. It is very important to note that these are state-owned tools and each state invests their own funds, to develop and maintain the websites, as well as conduct training and outreach in their areas. If we look towards the future with continuing GLRI support, a team at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab is working on runoff risk version three by applying post-processing techniques to the national water model output. Moving to this framework enables improved spatial and temporal resolution as well as allowing collaboration with states outside of the Great Lakes footprint. So to summarize, runoff risk is a dynamic real-time decision support tool based on post-processing of National Weather Service hydrologic model output. It was developed at state request and these unique state federal partnerships provide another tool in their conservation toolbox to meet nutrient reduction goals. It is hoped that voluntary adoption of these tools will lead to less nutrients applied shortly before runoff events, and that could result in an economic benefit for the producers, as well as the water quality benefit downstream. And if you have any questions, um, please uh, hit our YouTube page for various state and NOAA produced videos, and you can click on runoffrisk.info for a shortcut to all the four, four tools that are active. Thanks. Thank you, Dustin. This is a really helpful tool for, for a lot of people. It's now time for some questions. We appreciate those of you in our audience who have submitted them. Uh, do you have a question you want to ask? Type it in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Asia? Thank you, Kelly. Um, first question is for Scott. Uh, so this is an audience question. Why is the distribution of probabilistic output showing? In most cases, half of the solutions might be higher above the median than below the median solution. Uh, well, it uses an error distribution. So it, uh, um, it, you're looking at exceedance probabilities of exceeding different levels, like seeding flood stage, or you know, what's your 95% exceedance probability? Or, and so it can also be used for low flow also. You know, sometimes they want to know how low will their flow get? Um, so I don't know if that quite answered the question or not, but. <laughs> Great, and I can share with you the questions afterwards from the audience so that people can connect to you um, after we go through this. So um, Britt, uh, there are questions about um, a link for the video loop at some point, if you have it, able to, and you're able to share it with people. Um, and then someone asked, is the ice jam threat over for 2020? Well, you uh, you know from my presentation that I like my hedge words, right? So um, it it is uh, it de it depends. That's the that's the favorite answer in the weather service. It depends. It depends on where you are. Uh, I certainly don't have situational awareness for the ice jam threat throughout the the country, or actually even throughout the Northeast. But for my uh, little corner of uh, the Northeast, which is 15 counties in eastern New York and four counties in western New, New England, I would say that. I think we're in good shape for the season at this point. Yeah, I think um, most of the reports we're getting are of minimal ice along the edges of the river and uh, not much else going on. So, thanks. Great, thank you, Britt. Um, here's a question for Dustin from the audience. Uh, has there been any interest in the tool in additional states or river forecast centers? Um, yeah, we've had various other states um, outside of the Great Lakes that have reached out, um, and at this point, we're just kind of kind of keeping until keeping in that footprint of the Great Lakes until we can move over to a more um, nationally supported product. Great, thank you, Dustin. Um, one more for Britt. Um, the question is: I saw something about warmer wastewater effluent being released into ice jams in Ithaca to break them up. Is this a widely used practice? I don't know that it's widely widely used. I, I think that that is something that uh, that some folks try. I think there's also um, 
some places that have attempted to use um, like regulation from um, hydropower plants to try to the, use the water cycling of that to break up ice as well. So um, depending on where it is in the uh, where the, where the jam is in relation to where you're releasing that, that that could work. Great, thank you. Um, and then one more, I have time for one more question for Scott. Uh, why are there several methods of probabilistic forecasting currently out there in the weather service? <laughs> well, the MMEFS was sort of a grassroots thing that was created by the Eastern Region RFCs. Um, MARC, Northeast RFC, and Ohio RFC got together and it didn't require any additional resources, so they had all the tools they need, and so they just kind of did it on their own. Um, but now HEFS is a nationally supported, will be, and that'll become the the main probabilistic tool for the country. Will be HEFS, but that took a lot longer to develop, and it's a lot more complicated, and took more resources to get going. So, but we'll be everybody will be moving to HEFS eventually, I think. Great. Um, thank all of you guys for excellent answers and thanks to the audience again for great questions and back to Kelly for the last set. Thank you, Asia and the panelists. Awesome. Uh, you and the audience are hearing a lot about NOAA's hydrology efforts in forecasting and research today, but we also wanted to showcase a personal perspective from one of our hydrologists. Our next speaker's family immigrated to America in 1992 from Vietnam. Non Dang's parents were farmers who survived a lot of conflict in their country and never learned to read and write. Non is the only one in her family to attend college, and she graduated from the University of Minnesota in 2005 with a biology degree. She has spent years trying to establish a career in science, working in a research lab, then as a pharmacy technician with the Veterans Administration, then in an administrative job with the FAA. In 2017, she joined NOAA as an Administrative Support Assistant, or ASA, with the North Central River Forecast Center. She'll pick up her story there and share with us how she overcame obstacles to become a hydrologist. Non? Thank you, Kelly. To overcome barriers, I first needed to find allies. I needed a supportive agency, supportive office, and most importantly, a supportive manager. This manager has to be willing to help me sort through issues, work a flexible schedule, and encourage me when I hit barriers. Networking, people that know people that can get me the answers. I met Jeff Zellwinger at a new higher orientation, and he helped me get answers from HR when I could not. Sacrifices, my time, my dime, my commitment. How much am I willing to put in to get to my goal? I was working a full-time job, Going back to college for three semesters, I used up all of my annual leave to attend classes. I worked on Saturdays, study at night and Sundays. I attended less family functions and saw my, my friends even less. There is no guarantee. In 2020, after getting my credentials, HR filtered out my applications because I don't have official hydrology experience. As an ASA, hydrology was not in my job description so HR did not count any of the extra projects that I worked on as experience. I had to decide if I should go back for more classes or to continue on the current path. Perseverance, get back on the horse, figure out what I can do to get official experience, talk to my allies and chart a new route. Mentorship program, I applied for the 2021 program and I asked, how can I use it to help me? I needed a mentor that would help me achieve my goal. Utilizing the Lantern program. My mentor worked with my manager to get the Lantern position written for me. That way I can get the official hydrology experience to put on my job application. Apply to other positions. Apply for positions at other locations that I was qualified for. One is to practice with USA jobs application processes and two, to sharpen my applicant credentials by networking with other facilities or through interviews and feedback. Patience, understanding how the process works. I waited another 18 months before opportunities opened up at NCRFC for me to apply again. I practiced and I knew that my application should make it through HR, but you never know. My application got through, I passed the interview panel and I got the position. 
There is a saying in Vietnamese, Jiao Xiong Rung, waiting for fallen figs. I was not going to wait around for opportunities to fall on my lap, so I worked to overcome the barriers to get to my goal. You only get out what you put in. Thank you for letting me share my story with you, and back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Nan. And we really appreciate you sharing your useful advice based on your inspiring example. Our last two presenters will now talk about the future of hydrologic forecasting. Kevin Lau is a river forecaster for the National Weather Service's Missouri Basin River Forecast Center, located in Pleasant Hill, Missouri. He has been with the National Weather Service for 24 years and currently serves as a service coordination hydrologist, overseeing the center's outreach activities. Kevin also worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Kansas City and is a registered professional engineer in the state of Missouri. Today, he will discuss the findings of a recent study undertaken by his office to detect hydrologic trends within the Missouri River Basin. Are the rivers within the basin responding to a wetter climate? And if they are, what types of changes are occurring and where? Here's Kevin with the details. Thank you, Kelly, and good afternoon, everyone. My office for provides hydrologic products and services for the Missouri River Basin, shaded in dark blue in the upper left-hand corner of this graphic. Our efforts support a vast array of water, uh, surface water uses, such as those illustrated by the thumbnails running across the bottom of this slide. Our river stage, flow, and volumetric forecasts provide essential data to water resources managers engaged in water supply, flood mitigation, irrigation, navigation, recreation, reservoir operations, wildlife management, and water quality. An example of the historic response of a given river is depicted in the graph shown along the top center of this slide. This graph shows the continuous record of the flow along the Platte River at Louisville, Nebraska from 1979 through 2020. For the past several years, our office has used the 33-year period of analysis extending from 1979 to 2012 for developing what we would call the historic normal. This is the period shown in yellow on this center graph. This past winter, our office updated our system so that our historic normal now reflects the most recent 30-year period, 1991 to 2020. This period is shaded in blue on the central graph. This update from the former 33-year record to the new 30-year record provided a unique opportunity to compare hydrologic responses in the Missouri River Basin with an eye toward detecting any trends. Trends in peak flow and water quantity are shown in the lower left and lower right maps, respectively. We forecast 400-plus locations across the basin, with each location represented by a dot on these two maps. The magnitude and the color of the dots reflect increases or decreases in the hydrologic response over the most recent 30 years as compared to the previous 33-year period of analysis. Our comparison would suggest that the most significant changes are in the Northern Plains, where sizable increases in both peak flows, the map on the left, as well as increases in water quality or volume, the map on the right, appear to have occurred. While increases in water quantity would benefit many of the water uses shown along the bottom row of thumbnails, it could provide challenges to reservoir operations and maintaining acceptable water quality. Increases in peak flows would point toward an increase in flood risk. The hydrologic trends in peak flow and water quantity are just two examples of the sorts of comparisons that could be performed given this approach. Thank you and back to you, Kelly. All right, thank you, Kevin, very interesting work. Dr. Janet Entrieri is an atmospheric research scientist at NOAA's Physical Science Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. She has specialized in LIDAR remote sensing, polar cloud radiative processes, severe weather dynamics, and UAS technology. Today, she will be describing a field campaign that is currently in progress called SPLASH, which stands for Study of Precipitation, the Lower Atmosphere, and Surface for Hydrometeorology. 
I bet a lot of thought went into creating that acronym. <laughs> that sounds interesting, Janet. Share it with us. Thank you, Kelly, and happy Friday, everybody. I'd like to introduce you to the SPLASH campaign, which I cannot take credit for that acronym, but it is a one-year project located in the East River Valley in the Colorado Mountains, west of the Continental Divide. The East River feeds into the Colorado River Basin, both mapped on the left of my slide. The Colorado River Basin is the primary source of water for much of the southwestern U.S. However, persistent dry conditions, warming temperatures, and growing regional populations have created a lot of uncertainty about the Colorado River as a reliable water source in the future. This amplifies the need for informed water resource management and accurate forecasts across all timescales. Understanding snowmelt, which is the primary contributor of annual stream flow and reservoir storage, is a main motivation for SPLASH. The ability to accurately predict stream flow includes understanding mountain weather, clouds and precipitation type, soil moisture, snowpack properties, etc. In order to measure, evaluate, and understand these complex and coupled hydrometeorological processes, NOAA Research and our partners have deployed a unique suite of measurement systems. These state-of-the-art instruments from a variety of NOAA labs and our cooperative institutes include scanning and snow-level radars, instrumented towers, snow and soil sensors, surface energy budget systems, and uncrewed aircraft systems. We're also working with our weather service partners at the Grand Junction Colorado Forecast Office to better understand the forecast challenges in this very complex terrain. SPLASH is also in coordination with the University of Colorado and Colorado State University, the Department of Energy, the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, NCAR, and many others. The SPLASH observations will be used to evaluate NOAA's latest suite of models, including the UFS, the Rapid Refresh Forecast System, and the National Water Model. A goal of this project is to improve prediction of weather and water in the Colorado mountains and beyond. Finally, I've added an example of our SPLASH outreach efforts, the superheroes of SPLASH, that re are, represent each of those pictured instruments. The superheroes were developed to engage with the public and students of all ages. Additionally, we're participating in a variety of mentoring programs in coordination with NOAA and the Western Colorado University in Gunnison. So please refer to our SPLASH website for a list of all the instruments, our partners, near real-time products, photos, and other outreach materials, including additional superheroes. So um, thank you to the Central team for the invitation and to everyone for your attention. Thank you, Janet. Okay, it's now time for questions about these last three presentations. What questions do you have, Asia? All right, the first one is from Nan. Um, and this is just a general question about what are your, you, you went through so much, what are your plans for your next steps in your career, which I know is a huge thing to ask given how much you <laughs> went through to get here. Uh, I think my next step is to uh, get training and start being a hydrologist. So that's the, the next mountain that I have to climb. And I know it's a long hill up by a battle, but I think I'm up for it. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, next question is for Kevin. Uh, so this one uh, references the time series uh, that other river forecast centers use as a baseline. And so it mentions that another river forecast centers uses more than 60 years um, and suggests that longer periods of record could provide more robust results. And the question is, why did you opt to stay with a shorter period of analysis when more years are available? Well, in the, uh, that's a good question. I've been uh, posed to that question before. Um, so in the Missouri Basin, I would say 11 of the most significant catastrophic events in the basin have taken place since 1970. Um, and so we think that the trends um, are indicating 
uh, higher peaks for uh, a lot of the basin. So we believe that that a rolling 30 year uh, every 10 years is is the best way to capture the trends that we think are there. But good question. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is for Janet. Uh, for so the question is, what is the source of the soil moisture data being used in your effort? Um, that's a good question. We have several different um, means of doing that. One is from unmanned aircraft. Another are um, different soil moisture surveys that we are conducting uh, throughout the seasons. We're looking at the aircraft data from the snow surveys, and we have different soil moisture sensors um, at each of the different sites. And one thing I was not able to say is that we have different measurement sites located along the river valley going from north to south. Great, thank you. Um, the question for Kevin again, uh, was there an offsetting area of flow decreases seen in the area to balance the area of flow increases? <laughs> That's also a good question and no. Um, the only place where uh, there was any sort of uh, significant or appreciable, I should say appreciable, uh, decrease was in the uh, mountainous west in the Yellowstone Basin. Uh, but for the remainder of the basin, we, we only saw increases of varying magnitude, but, but increases uh, far outweighed the decreases. Great. Thank you. Um, and then a question for Janet again. Do you take burn scar areas into consideration for splash? Um, that there currently is not a burn scar area within our um, campaign site. So that it will, is not part of the present kind of um, overview of conditions that we're looking at, but um, if there was one that presented itself, then that would be, uh, you know, that would be of great interest because it presents so many different conditions that you would need to consider, including things like albedo and um, uh, vegetation coverage and snowpack um, evolution. So, but it, there's not currently one in our area. Great, thank you. Um, so all of your presentations were excellent, and I'd like to um, open the, the floor back up to all of our presenters right now and ask a, a few more questions to everyone. So if everyone could come back on camera, that'd be great. Excellent. Thank everyone. Um, I'm going to circle back through some questions that came up earlier. Um, one for JJ, uh, is the validation set for flash floods available to share? I don't see JJ here now. Yeah. The, oh, there you are. Yeah. Yes. Um, if, if you're interested in you uh, the storm reports, and those are readily available online. Um, so there are a number of different places you can get them. Uh, Stormdat, as you may be aware, are, are kind of the officially submitted reports that, that are um, archived at, uh, at uh, NCDC. Um, so uh, it's been renamed, sorry, NCEI. <laughs> so you can go there to pull those and then, uh, you can get them before they become official. Those are local storm reports and there are a number of places you can obtain those. I get mine from a, uh, a website that's uh, maintained at Iowa State. Uh, so they have a nice uh, uh, portal there where you can access all sorts of information. So. I recommend, it, recommend going there. Great, and I'll connect you to the person that asked that question later so you can share that. Um, a question for Ryan, how is your office evolving to meet the ever-growing needs for hydro data and support from other partners? Um, with our chip system that we currently use, we're able to ingest more data than we've ever been able to. Um, the biggest thing right now is formatting of that data and getting it in to where our forecasters can utilize it and then uh, just applying that as best we possibly can in real time just to push the most accurate stuff out to the public as fast as possible. Great, thank you. Um, a question for Britt. Um, 
So, and this sort of flows from the question earlier or relates to it. Is there anything that we can do to mitigate ice dams? So that, yeah, the other questioner mentioned water, using water to mitigate them, but are there other mitigation options? Sure, yeah, despite it being the first idea that most folks have, blowing up the ice jams is not uh, normally very effective. At least it hasn't been in my service area. Mostly it causes collateral damage and doesn't have very reliable effects on the ice jam itself. Um, there's also, you know, waning political appetite for extreme measures like that. You have an ice jam that's a natural occurrence, and then once humans take action, suddenly they're liable for what happens. Um, but there's other less dramatic options that are available. Kind of, again, it depends. Um, some of the things that folks are working on um, usually involve working on, kind of like the effluent, um, involve working on the intact river ice before the jam happens. Um, stuff like uh, icebreaker tugs, um, strewing uh, some dark matter, usually it's dark leaf matter on top of the ice to sort of help it uh, rot in place. Uh, and even some some studies that are working on trying to capture source ice or break it up. So a bunch of different options. Again, it kind of depends on where you are and what, what exactly the problem is. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, a question for Nan now. Uh, what is your best advice for someone considering a mid um, or mid career change? Uh, I think it has to go with um, you need to look at you know all the little steps that I have that like the sacrifices that you're going to need to put in the time commitment and do you have a good support? Do you need to find your allies and your networking processes and start to work it out? Um, see how much time you're willing to put in to get this goal that you want. It can be done. It all has to be up to you to put in the time and the commitment and, you know, just work out with networking and get the support that you need to succeed. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I've got several questions with the flavor of, you know, how do we, or yeah, what's the process that we use to um, make National Water Center and National Water Model experimental product, products available to external users? So um, that's, I can ask that to a number of you guys. How do you push your experimental products out to the public or what, are the, what is the testing that happens to get there? I can take that answer. So it's actually a really lengthy process and then there is a special a number of directives and documents associated with that. But without boring you all too much, um, the way it has worked is that Ryan is kind of smiling because he happens to be a part of our review board, but we have a set up or enlisted all those volunteers within the National Weather Service hydro community um, throughout weather service uh, representation, weather service office representation, river forecast center representation, regional offices representation. And those uh, team actually helped us review each prototype that we proposed to push to those like official processes. So that way they can help us um, and then provide us the feedback from their perspectives and then make, make the prototypes a little better um, before it gets to a um, the experimental stage. Anyway, so once that um, once that the the board approves of that prototype, then as long as the, all the paperwork goes well, voting goes well, it can go to then prototype stage. And then like it, you know, we have the feedback period from the entire National Weather Service. And then after that, it goes to like experimental product stage where we can collect the feedback from the public, et cetera, et cetera, before it becomes to the official. Uh, public product. So I am saying like this is like one to two year process um, in a nutshell uh, without boring you with the special documentation number and whatnot. Thank you. That was a great answer. I appreciate it. Um, and with that, um, I will turn it over to Kelly. I appreciate all of you guys and, and I'll let her wrap up. Thank you, Asia, the, and everyone. The time goes by so quickly. That wraps today's three-minute thesis webinar on NOAA's hydrology efforts. We've had a lot of good questions and very nice comments from the audience. If we didn't get to yours, don't worry, we will pass it along to the panelists. As we end, please stay on for one more minute to answer a few brief questions that will appear on your screen. Your feedback really is helpful as we plan future webinars like this one. 
And a big, big thanks to all of our wonderful panelists today, coordinators Bethany Perry and Asia Shumalo, as well as you, our audience. I hope you have learned something new. And I also hope you'll join us for our next webinar in June. We'll be focusing on heat. If you are interested in checking out past webinars or to find information about future webinars, visit our website, www.noaa.gov slash central region, where you will also find more great information. Thanks again for your participation and have a fine day.